Digitel is one of the leading companies for live streaming events, running corporate virtual events, or managed webinars. If you're looking to reach worldwide markets or generate revenue from adding a virtual component to your meetings and conferences, leverage Digitel's 33 years of experience in creating flawless online events. For more information, go to digitellinc.com or email them at contactus at digitel.com. Welcome to Gather Geeks, a podcast by BizBash, the place where people passionate about meetings and events come together. Here are your hosts, BizBash CEO David Adler and Editor-in-Chief Beth Kormanick. Hi, David. Hey, Beth. Here we are. Another Gather Geeks. And our guest today is Scott Cullither, the co-founder and CEO of the brand communications agency Invent. That's the word invent without the E. Uh, Scott, who's based in New York, co-founded the company in 2008. The company was acquired by Time Inc. in 2015, but its founders bought it back last year. Cullither describes the company's business as specializing in live brand storytelling. He's bullish on events and we're going to find out why. Um, David, I'm wondering, you know, do you think that the role of the agency has changed? Oh, I don't think you can recognize an agency from just a few years ago, especially with the uh, with events becoming so important in uh, in the mix of marketing. An agency is no longer someone that places ads. These experiential agencies are 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 driving the driving the ship in many cases. Uh, and it's the character of, of marketing has changed dramatically because of events. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to hear a lot about his philosophy on that and how he has, um, with his, with his team has grown and shaped their, their philosophy and what, what they're doing specifically when they sit down with brands to say, here's what we can do for you and get your message out. Uh, so let's take a listen. Scott, welcome to gather geeks. Thank you, Beth. Great to be here. Well, we are, are glad that you're here and we have a lot to talk about um, based on the roller coaster that Invent has been on, uh, both as a, a startup in the event community, the acquisition by Time, and now you're back on your own. Yeah. Um, so for those who aren't familiar with Invent, give us a very quick description of what you do. Yeah, of course. So uh, I'm Scott Cullither. I'm, I'm uh, one of the co-founders and the CEO of Invent. Uh, Invent started in 2008 in the height of the economic recession uh, with the aspiration of becoming a uh, global um, brand communications agency. And for me at the time, live events was just one of the tools in our toolbox to becoming an effective brand communications agency. So, so we, we sort of built from our core, which was live events, and then we moved into digital, social, mobile, uh, print, uh, and other things, um, PR events and so on. Uh, today, um, we're sort of refocused. Uh, and our, uh, our our vision is to become the um, the, the very best uh, live brand storytelling agency in the world. And when you say live events were, were one of the tools, and it's where you are are really see the growth of the company, are you talking about conceiving and, and planning them? Like what what um, part of the life cycle event of right, the event right. are you involved in? So so for us, it's it's uh, conceptualization. Um, it's design, it's strategy, and then it's the tactical pull through. Uh, so it's all of the things that go into that, uh, visual identity and planning and, and messaging. Uh, but then it's also the actual activation or the on-site execution. So it is the uh, design and production of what the environment looks like, what the attendee experience feels like, um, what the executives perhaps would say if it, if it were a corporate event. Um, what consumers would feel and take away if it were a uh, more of a consumer facing event rather than a, a B2B event um, and and all of the pull through that goes along with that. Mm -hmm. okay. Do you want to like talk about your event DNA? Uh, you had mentioned that your father worked for Jack Morton when Jack Morton was a real person. There was a real <laughs> Why Jack did you Morton give us in the, the world. Give us your sort of thumbnail sketch of, uh, of how events have influenced you from an early age. Wow. So, so um, great, great question. My father was the 13th employee at Jack Morton. And Jack Morton uh, is now the, one of the largest event 
marketing organizations in the world. They are. They are. In fact, I think they're branded now as JMWW, Jack Morton Worldwide. So it used to be Jack Morton Productions. Uh, Jack was a very uh, prominent band leader in Washington, D.C. area. Uh, and uh, through uh, some neighbors met my father uh, as he was coming up out of college and my father was looking for a job and uh, Jack wound up and hired uh, my well, dad. How did, how did Jack Morton go from, I didn't know that he was a band leader. How mm. did he go from a band leader to, to an event person? Well, so, so in the early days, he, he used to design and produce all of the uh, music events for trade associations, primarily bar mitzvahs and, and uh, well-to-do uh, uh, families for birthday parties and so on. Uh, the trade association work that he was doing as a band leader led him into doing bigger things and at the time was revolutionary and began to produce you know the what was the initial or the beginnings of multimedia through slide projectors and that eventually evolved into industrial theater and video production and fast forward 45 or 50 years and here we are today and what kind of events did your dad do so he primarily did uh, trade association work so he was in Washington DC uh, which by the way we have an office there now um, and it's 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 it is the hotbed for all of the trade associations so he would do design and produce the annual meetings for some of the larger trade associations and did you ta tag along with them at any of these? Oh, of course and of course well, get, in fact, take one us of, back to one of them well one of the well so I I used to uh, I, when I got old enough so I was 13 or 14 years old probably I used to run house lights for my father's shows and uh, so I would put on the clear com uh, and get the cue to bring the house lights down or take the house lights up and um, one of my one of the favorite photographs that I have uh, uh, in in my um, a photo portfolio is a photograph of my father uh, and Sammy Davis Jr. and myself and I'm probably nine or ten years old in the picture and I'm at one of my dad's shows and I was introduced to Sammy. That's wow. amazing. So you're a second generation event professional. I am. But the world that you're living in today is so different from what you grew up in. Um, what What is the biggest change you see between then and now and the approach to events? Yeah, well, I, it, it's, it, you know, not to state the obvious, but it, but we live in a digital world, so to speak. And so um, everything that any one of us does in our industry um, has to be tempered through the lens of that we are designing and producing and executing something that the world is going to see. Because we're, we live in an age of what I would like to call citizen journalists. So every, every attendee at every single event, whether it's a public event or a highly, uh, highly high security private uh, event there is a there is a chance uh, a likelihood that whatever is designed produced said can, will come out to the public and so I think that fundamentally is the biggest thing that's different today than it was 35 or 40 years ago when I was a young kid being introduced to the business yeah, I was speaking with a group um, and of of sea level folks and about their events and um, and I was just kind of shocked at how they didn't really realize that point that you were just making. I said, whether you know it or not, your event is on social media. So you need to prepare for that eventuality because everybody has that smartphone in their pocket and wants to um, induce FOMO and everybody else of, of where they are. Or if it's an incentive trip, their, their spouse is going to be the one doing it. So uh, you need to uh, be aware of that from a, not only from a design point of view, a content point of view, liability point of view, all of the above. I, th I think that's absolutely right, Beth. And, and the, 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 the thing is that um, I think there are something like two billion millennials in the world right now, and uh, I read somewhere that that Gen um, Y is going to surpass the millennials. Gen so, Z, uh, Gen Z is going to yeah. thank you. Gen Z is going to surpass the millennials. Oh, yeah. So before you know it, we're going to have like five billion social zealots in the world and they're going to be at our events again whether they're private or public but, and they're going to be socializing these events right but we had a conversation earlier about how they're just in the recent few years there's been you know i kind of feel that we're in this post digital age a little bit that that it's not just about the new shiny object and necessarily about just being social for the sake of social but that events are driving social you want to comment on that? Uh, absolutely, Your thoughts on absolutely. That? So, so there is this notion of FOMO, right? Fear of missing out, and um, I do think that we, to a degree, are in a post 
uh, digital era, post-social era in terms of digital socialization, except when you come to an event. If you look at sort of the spike moments of, of social media, you look at the trending things, um, even, even, even the stuff on Donald Trump these days, our president, it's generally around some sort of an event that he has been at. Uh, so there are these, in my opinion, there are these sort of dormant periods in between these moments of live events. So I think as a live event professional, we have a tremendous opportunity because the more, uh, the more millennials and gens that we have at, at our disposal and as a potential target audience, the more we have the ability to influence messaging and content by way of the events that, that we design and produce. Mm -hmm. So client comes to you and says, we want to do an event. Where does the conversation go from there? Why? Why? We start with why. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think. Oh, that, and, okay. Oh, I'm going to push you on why. Yep. But what is the most prevalent why that you get? Like if you aggregate all the whys, why? <laughs> well, right. So the answer that we get is because we want to drive uh, our consumers or our customers to change a certain kind of behavior. And I think it, that is entirely true. What comes after the why is we want to do something that is extremely different and that's never been done before. Of course, everybody wants yeah. to do something then, that's never then, been done before. And, right, right. <laughs> and then we ask why. Uh, and again, it's because they want to drive behavior uh, patterns, whether whether you're a, you know, a B2B or a B2C uh, organization, you want to drive the way people uh, think, feel, behave, and perform in some way. And so we, we always begin with a why, and then we, we use uh, a, a proprietary sort of creative and strategic process to get us from the why to the what, uh, and that's called invention. And basically, it takes our uh, clients and prospective clients through the maze of the beginning, like all this confusion about what they really want to do to what what they should do. Uh, and we help through this, this idea of invention to bring a sense of clarity uh, to why the strategy is right, why the messaging is right, why the tactical pull through is right, and why the return on investment is going to be there in the end. So you want to bring us through a couple of those points to see like what your first meeting looked like uh, when you're going through the process? Yeah, sure, sure. So um, we recently launched the uh, Samsung uh, Galaxy, Galaxy Note 8 uh, for Samsung. It was uh, last year. It happened to be the product that was going to replace um, the one that they had to remove from the market. So it was a very big bet of theirs. Um, we began uh, with the question of, of why, uh, and they in essence said that they needed to replace the revenue uh, decline that had happened uh, since the original uh, Gal or the Galaxy 7. Um, we then took them through the process of, of um, what's your target audience? What, what are your key messages? What do, what do the outcomes need to be? And as a result of that sort of exercise, we began to develop our strategy and our tactical pull through. And so what we designed was a live event for uh, journalists, uh, uh, influencers, um, and their key customers um, that in essence took th those attendees through a live experience that brought to life the features and the benefits of the Galaxy Note 8 in real time, in real world, uh, through the design and execution of the event itself. So what did that look like? So it was a, um, a, a massive uh, three-dimensional uh, video wall uh, made out of, of LED panels. Um, and it was the floor and the two uh, back walls uh, were combined together to create a seamless integrated mosaic of imagery uh, that when we did live product demos that showed how the Galaxy Note 8 became a design and creative tool for those that, that used it, uh, whether you were in the creative business or not, those, those uh, product demos came to life all around the audience and all around the, uh, the, the, the demonstrators or the executives that were making those presentations. This was in Korea? This was not. It was here at the uh, uh, Park Avenue Armory. Park Avenue, okay. Yep. Weren't you recently in 
I was. You? I just got back from China. Actually. China, China. Yeah. That's why I know. Yeah. I saw you on. You're all over Facebook. I mean, <laughs> how many followers do you have on? Uh, you're uh, well, like I think a huge uh, social on, influence uh, guy. On, uh, well, I, <laughs> not as big as I used to be because I I am one of those too, like you, David, where I don't socialize as much. Um, I think I have three hundred thousand tw- that's Twitter followers. Damn good. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. I've been doing it a long time. Yeah. You know, and there's a strategy behind it. So, what is the strategy behind it? Well, I, you, you, first off, you don't want to you don't want to tw- 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 socialize too much because you become white noise. Uh, you want to make sure that you understand uh, your followers, if you will. In my, in my particular case, it's important because I do use. Uh, Twitter and Instagram in particular for business purposes. Facebook I use more for my own personal um, uh, use. Uh, And so I want to understand my followers. So I want to make sure that I am uh, socializing things that are relevant to them that are of interest. Uh, And then there's a whole cadence and, um, and coordination effort on how to hashtag certain things what words to use okay give us uh, a couple of, can you give us a couple of secrets yeah yeah of course so 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 on the galaxy note 8 for instance um i would i would probably well i did um a retweet uh and then attach certain keywords uh of a of a big influencer so not only do i then connect myself to the in, the influencer who has like two million followers uh but i've also used words that hashtag uh, Galaxy Note 8, hashtag Samsung, hashtag South Korea, things like that, that, uh, that w- then will be searched for. And then my tweets or my Instagrams will come up as a result of that. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is to work very, very hard at getting certified followers to follow you because everybody wants to, uh, you know, s- social platforms are social influence. And if you're connected to somebody, that means you've got some level of influence. And so the more, I believe, the more um, certified followers that you can have follow you. And that's people with the check marks beside their name. Yeah, correct. Mm-hmm. The little t- Twitter logo mm-hmm. or the Instagram. Yep. Mm-hmm. Uh, the more of those that, that will follow you, the more people also will follow you because they want you to, in turn, follow them. So for an event, a major event like the the Galaxy Note 8 launch, um, how many times would you tweet or Instagram uh, mentions of that event? So I pushed out, I would say uh, it was a one day event. Mm-hmm. Um, I pushed out probably six uh, posts. Okay. And and I, I, I personally picked uh, moments that I did it and then our company picked moments that, that the company did it uh, and then certain uh, inventors that were on the show picked moments that they did it, and then we wove to, we wove together a story accordingly so that it wasn't redundant because we, mm-hmm. we do have overlap in followers. So again, you don't want to become white noise. Sure. One of the things about what I've noticed about what you do is that most agencies don't have an influencer at the agency that mm. actually works uh, and and makes it has an impact. Um, they 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 don't really they're not as social as you are. Um, and it seems like it's a sort of little bit of a secret sauce. It, it very much is. I mean, if you, th- if you think about it, um, you know, beyond the context of live events, give social media an opportunity to, uh, to amplify, which I do think that is the case. A lot of people would say, well, social media amplifies live events that there is that, right? So when we do a live event, we only had, uh, 2,500, people in attendance at the Samsung uh, Galaxy Note 8 launch, but I, I had 230,000 followers on my Twitter account, and I had several retweets of my account that was tweeted by people who have 100,000 or 200,000. So all of a sudden, the amplification becomes massive. And so I think that it is a little bit of a secret sauce because a, a, a company that has an agency that does have an influencer or two on the team helps to amplify that live event. Oh, yeah, I think it's a, it's it's really interesting. Yeah, um, and also, and you, you know, you can t- you know, there's right. this notion of, and you guys know it much better than I do. There's this notion of of earned me- the value of earned media and the value of paid media, and I think that uh, you can debate which one is better, and I'm not going to get into that. But I think that you can say that for sure there are different levels of earned media, mm-hmm. and when you have when you have um, attendees who are at an event and they choose to socialize something on their own they will say basically what they want. You can get a real gauge 
as to the success or failure of of that event or or what the what the sort of the pulse was of that event through those social media posts how do you feel about the uber influencer uber influencers now is it is it fraudulent or is it for real it seems like it's so transactional now that that they're not believed as much i would agree with that uh, i would agree they're 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 unfortunately going by the way of of paid spokespeople you know so th there was a time when celebrity athletes wow they've endorsed my product it must be a great product that, that's become a little bit like white noise and i think we have the same challenge with uber influencers do you see that what's the next thing that's going to happen that's going to be able to break through the clutter Wow, that's a great question. I mean, I think yeah, that, if we can answer that question, we yeah, would all be doing yeah. really well. I mean, I think, that, you know, the, the, the great chase for us in the live event business is uh, how do I demonstrate or really prove return on investment? Right. So I think that that that's something that we're all still trying to find the you, holy. You, well, you're the you're the guru on this. How do you what is your when you go to a, in, to a client and you say that we're going to actually the ROI will be good on this, how do you know? Yeah, that? well, right now what we're doing is we're setting KPIs, key performance indexes, with with our clients, and we'll mutually agree to what those KPIs are. Uh, sometimes they're amount of social media impressions. Sometimes they're uh, just media impressions in general, the quality. So it could be media driven. Um, you know, there's the old fashioned uh, attendee poll. Um, but there, but there, there is also the, this uh, notion of uh, getting attendees involved beforehand uh, and having them become a part of the uh, design evolution so that you have an understanding of what, and it's cross-section of attendees, you have an understanding of what they're really looking for and what they really want out of the event. How does and, that, what does that look like? What do so you it's mean like by focus, that? It's almost like a focus group. A focus group. group. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so if we had done it for uh, the Galaxy Note 8, we didn't. But if we had done it, we would have taken one or two of their uh, executives, uh, one or two of their salespeople, several uh, influencers, uh, a couple of their top key customers, and we would have put them in a blind focus group environment, not necessarily face to face or amongst one another, but we would have put them through a focus group activity that we then would have been able to establish KPIs and we would say to uh, our client at that point, here are the key performance indexes that we've set. What do you think? Yes, we agree. Okay, let's measure against how we do on those. When you say an act a focus group activity, what does that look like? Well, it can take any kind of shape or form, and we've done them um, in in a in a room uh, with uh, two way one way right, glass. Right. What are you what are you, um, what are you trying to get out of that of those people? What are you asking? Ah, uh, yeah, right, right, right. So we're trying to get out. We're trying to dig to the core of the apple and figure out what really is important and why would they invest a day of their time, two days of their time, three days of their time. Why would they give me that? most valuable asset of theirs and what would they want in return and so then we begin to explore and depending on the event and the purpose of the event all it could take many different shapes but in essence we we really want to try and grind down to the core of that apple and then we will develop a series of of a key objectives that we see how we measure against from one of your past events what's an insight that you learned that you then incorporated into an event well, this whole notion of, of citizen journalism where we can, uh, we do a lot of, of consumer facing events. Um, the, the more that we can create consistency of message uh, from whoever the key uh, sponsor or the key um, stakeholder is for that event, the more we can create key messages from that person, the more consistent those citizen journalist messages are going to be. And so to me, that, that, that is, a, a, is a very big uh, differentiator between a successful event and, and one that's not as successful. One, one that, that has 10 or 12 different messages that are confusing or diluted or not as potent uh, doesn't have the same success to me as one that is more focused and has two or three really strong messages behind it. Mm -hmm. So that's what, you, that's what you try to bring everything to, to one or two key messages at an event? Yes. Invest in yourself and your staff with self-paced online event education designed to fit into your busy schedule. Subscribe to the Event Leadership Institute for only $25 per month and gain access to an extensive on-demand video library of classes, as well as interviews with industry leaders. Best of all, you can watch classes in small pieces or all at once. 
For more information, visit eventleadershipinstitute.com. Um, last night I was at uh, an upfront for Oath. They have a they had a brand um, a brand um, uh, tunnel. How do you get the messages when you have a large group of people coming? How do you, is that sort of what is happening now? This brand tunnel, like you tell the message before you actually get into the room, is that sort of common way? Well, I've seen it. A lot, I mean, it is, yeah, it is. It is. I think I think smart companies are trying to. Um, be you know so so we only have a limited a finite amount of time that we have these people right, right. That, that whatever the target audience is so the, the the moment that you can begin to grab their attention and the moment that you can begin to inform them of the messages you start to you start to grab them right and so the earlier we can do that and the more effectively we can do that the better off we are and so i think what you're what you're suggesting is a result of that idea the brand the tunnel it, it, or the it, brand it, elevator or something it's like going up to the world trade center and you yeah, sit in the elevator it, you're stuck it's almost <laughs> like you know going back to the old uh theme park days yeah. when you stood online for whatever disney ride it was and they played these little teaser videos for you to get you ready for the ride it's, right. it's similar in concept so that you know you you've you've sort of cleansed out any distracting stuff and you've got people now focused on what is really important to that event before we started uh, recording, you said something really interesting that I'd like you to expand on. Um, you said the the directive from your clients these days is to spend smartly, spend smart, spend smartly versus lavishly. What is what is an example of a smart spend versus a lavish spend? Right. So, um, well, let, let me let me put it this way: we we just launched the um, the the newest Atlantis Hotel property in Sanya, China. Um, part of the uh, design and execution of that launch event was a uh, very, very expensive fireworks show. Oh, they did that when they opened the one? In Dubai. In Dubai. Yeah, it was, yeah. Very, it was very similar. So yeah. the entire building became a fireworks uh, display. So um, in that particular setting, that was a smart spend because they wanted to create a sense of uh, luxury and excitement and fun. Um, and so that, that to me was on brand, on message, on point to, to, to what the Atlantis brand stands for and what they wanted to be in Sanya, China. Uh, and yet it was disruptive in a, in a good way. Now, if we were at a, uh, a conference for um, Bloomberg, and and we did a fireworks display at Bloomberg. I think that we're not on brand, we're not on point, we're not on message with the with them anymore. And we've done something that is seen as lavish. So I think there's a very it's subtle, but I think it's a big distinction between because I use the exact same example. Fireworks in one case works really really well, and was perceived by that audience in the right way. Fireworks at a Bloomberg financial conference is yeah. is going to have a very different connotation. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and so we, we 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 like to call it purposeful creative, and so um, we're not we're not fans of of doing unique, cool, fun stuff for the sake of doing cool, fun stuff. It's got to it's got to have the right purpose, and it's got to truly represent the brand and and the integrity of of the message that's that the uh, that the the sponsors or the the um, key stakeholders want to communicate. I had a friend of mine who is a CM is a CMO of a company, of a major media company, and he recently said that he was surprised that the level of intellect of a lot of the CMOs of major brands are they're de so dependent on outsourcing everything that they're they're not thinking as strategically because they're depending on the agencies. Are you seeing that at all? Or is it, is it dependent on you guys as third party planner, third party agencies? It, it, it is, it is. And, and I think one of the things that makes, that I'm really proud of our agency and I think makes us great is that we're true collaborators uh, in that process. And so we get those C-suite, those CMOs or those, the, the heads of design or whatever that will come to us and say sort of, here's our challenge 
here's what's keeping me up at night. Can you come up with the idea? And then we'll come up with an idea and then they'll yes and it. And then we collaborate together and make it truly exceptional. So while they're leaning on us as an agency, we're also leaning on them to make sure that, that, that what we do is exactly right. But why is an event a good solution for marketing now? Why do you think that it's so hot? We talked about that a little bit. Well, look, I think it's, I think it is the only medium in the world that, that directly connects the heart, the mind, and the body to a brand or a purpose. Um, you know, n no offense to television, no offense to, to, to computer ads, no offense to print. There's a medium that stands between the, the heart, the mind, and the body and whatever that, that brand is. And so live events is actually the only medium in the world that doesn't have that, that barrier, if you will. The downside, I think, and the advantage that those other platforms has is scale, mm -hmm. you know, and we've yet to really, outside of the social media and the, and the, the citizen journalists, we've yet as an industry to really master how do you go to scale. You know, when we, when we did the Galaxy Note 8, we live streamed to 48 million people. So we were able to take a 2,800 person audience and turn it into 48 million people with a few thousand bucks you know in today's technology so that's pretty powerful yeah no, but it's uh, we were we were talking earlier about um uh, some of our friends from jack morton who talk about how how um it's all about um seen by few experienced by many mm. Mm. And that seems to be one of the major strategies now for yeah. events. Yeah. I mean, you, you asked me earlier, like, what's the next big breakthrough? I think that that, that is something there, which is uh, seen by few, experienced by many. How do you, it, it's easy to create a, a, a dialogue. Actually, no, it's, it's, it's I think I'm wrong. Around. It's not. It's, the other way around. It's, it's experienced mm -hmm. by few, seen, seen by, by many. many. Right. I'm sorry. You, yeah. you are, you're, you're correct. Yes, yes. The, the whole, I think one of the holy gra grails is to experience by few, experienced by many. Yeah. So if we can shift that paradigm, then, then I think we're there. Because the one thing you can do with a live event is you can create a dialogue. And so you can create a real experience, right. which you have a hard time doing when you do a digital component is to, exp so if we can design the events to become a digital experience as much as it is right now is just a viewing platform, then I think that will be sort of the next frontier. Yeah, I'm trying to think of recent examples where where that's possible because you have um, an amazingly successful um, television advertisement. You dilly dilly became the catchphrase for everybody, right? With Bud Light and, and you saw it everywhere. Um, but then you have moments like Coachella, Beyonce's performance that first weekend that Everybody was that was the it. cultural conversation that's a live event but it's also beyonce let's be honest and so where where does that leave a brand when it comes to events like um how are you thinking about that moment like do they ever come to see, come to you and say we want something to go viral like is that ever the the directive or the ultimate goal um i, I don't it's not as direct as that i think that um you know, the, what we typically get is they want to change behavior in some way. And so in the case of Samsung, they didn't necessarily have to say they wanted it to go viral. They just wanted to sell, you know, millions of these smartphones. And so we knew as one of our directives that it, we needed to do something that went viral, you know. And so um, the, what, what we're hearing is that they that they want to create, you know, a change in the way people are behaving or thinking and so, on some level. Mm -hmm. Uh, let me switch a little bit to um, how uh, big brands are doing events, but how are they finding you as an agency and others to produce them? Is it is, how much is it RFP driven? How much of it is relationship driven? I mean, what advice do you give to people that are looking to get some of these big brands? I know that you want them all. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Well, I th I think that you know one of the things we did really well when we were uh, when we were a startup and and we were an unknown agency is that that we developed relationships um, with folks like you guys. You know, uh, and uh, when you know David Adler, you you know a lot of people. <laughs> uh, you know, and so I would say that you know b become active, become um, a part of different organizations. Network, network, network. That, 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 I think that's number one. That's kind of old school. Um, create create a, a footprint for yourself, like a digital footprint for yourself. So um, there are very inexpensive ways to generate a press release. 
uh, around an event that you've done. Um, there are a lot of, of, of uh, platforms and publications that are looking for content. You know, they're, they're, they're starving for content. Give them something unique to talk about. Give them something unique to, to put to their consumers uh, or their brand loyalists. Um, and, and then um, I think that capitalize on the work that you've done. Uh, pe people want to work with people who are successful. You know, they, they want to, uh, one, one of the things that we've seen since we did the Galaxy Note 8 is the spike in business that we've, that we've gotten. To your point, because it did go viral and there were so many people that saw it, we had a lot of prospective clients that saw it and then all of a sudden our phone rings or we get an email saying, hey, we want to do something like that. Um, so capitalize on you know the, the work that, that you've done regardless of what it is um, and then be smart about who who you're speaking to I mean you know we're, we're all fighting for resources and there's only so much money that that each company has or agency has so be really smart about who you're speaking to and how you're speaking to them so as an agency though like uh, we, I just did an, we just did an interview with um, a woman that runs a company called happily.io which is an execution arm for event agencies agencies. Uh, where is the, is it the intellectual strategy capital that most agencies do and they outsource a lot of the other stuff? Is that still sort of the holy grail for how you guys do it? Because yeah, you I can't think, do everything. I mean, that, that is our, that is our, our philosophy. I mean, when we started in 2008, it was the height of the economic meltdown. Um, we, we basically started with our own capital, we, so we didn't have a lot of money. So, uh, so rather than build a lot of brick and mortar, resources, we leaned into the fact that we were lean and nimble and cost effective and we were transparent about what we outsourced and what we didn't and where our margins were made and where they weren't. And so I think the, the successful companies right now have, have that kind of model happening. For us, as we continue to grow, one of the strategies that, you know, if we're going to become the best live brand storytelling agency in the world, one of the strategies is to be able to win a global account like Microsoft. We just became uh, agency of record for Microsoft. So we're beginning to do work for them all over the world. So in order to do that, we've got to become sort of the brand ambassador of their live events, meaning that we've got to understand their messaging and their visual identity, but we also have to understand the quality of the execution for tier one, tier two, tier three shows for them all over the world, whether they're you know, um, industry events or their private events or whatever. Uh, but then we have to we have to activate authentically. So if we had thousands and thousands of inventors here in New York and we traveled them to some part, let's call South America, we go to Rio uh, and we bring a bunch of New Yorkers to activate a program for them in New York, it's not going to go that well. So we've found tremendous success in uh, a smaller, tighter group, an agency driven model, and then we outsource. Um, so not only has it made us cost effective, uh, but it's allowed us to activate authentically all over the world. When we did the um, the, the Atlantis launch in Sanya, China, um, we, we drew from five different countries. Um, so we had inventors from five different countries. We probably had 15 or 18 full-time inventors there. And yet on certain days, we had 200, full, 200 employees on the ground, most of whom were Chi Chinese. Oh, that's incredible. Um, and I want to switch to one other topic that uh, in terms of I know that you guys were did a lot of work with Pepsi and the Super Bowls we did these big huge umbrella events does the I mean are they worth it for the brands to get that involved I mean it's the Super Bowl and the Olympics and things like that is that still as important as ever uh, in terms of bringing the brands into where the people are I assume it is, it is. sort of like it that. is it is but is it getting even bigger or is it is it sort of at a certain point now? It is. I, th I think it's getting bigger, and I think this is really great for our industry. Uh, and again, going back to the demographics of who the worker population is, you know, 78% of millennials uh, would rather have an experience over over a real gift. Right. Like, you like, don't give me a diamond ring anymore. Right. Take me to Coachella for my, for my engagement, you know? Um, and so I think what brands are doing is they're realizing what the target audiences really want. And so they're starting to focus more and more on live live experiences rather than other forms of, of advertising. In, at case. these big uh, touch point uh, uh, moments, uh, events. C correct. Right. Correct. correct. 
Do you yep. see any new major events that are happening that you guys are jumping on? Well, we're, we're uh, in the process of designing the 50th anniversary of Woodstock. Uh, which you'll be excited to know happens in 2019. Wow. Tell us uh, more about that. Yeah, really, really exciting. So it is uh, in a place called Bethel Woods. Yes, we know it well. <laughs> uh, which is in uh, Liberty, New York. Yeah. Uh, not a lot of people knew that Woodstock didn't happen in Woodstock, New York. And um, Beth Bethel Woods is owned by a gentleman named Alan Geary, uh, who, who is uh, a retired cable uh, industry titan. Uh, and he has the, um, the vision of celebrating the 50th anniversary of Woodstock on the grounds that, that he now owns called Bethel Woods. And so we've been selected to partner with Live Nation, uh, the Geary Foundation, uh, and IDECO. Uh, to design and produce this extraordinary experience to, to mark the 50th anniversary. So you're going to have other brands underneath this umbrella as well. That Absolutely. Are, that you're going to, you don't care who, I mean, you care, but you want to make sure it's curated properly, but other people will be involved. C correct. Like the Super Bowl. Yeah. So correct. You're, what's your role specifically? What we so we're, we're the, we're the uh, agency of record that's, that's overseeing and producing the event. And then Live Nation is, uh, is a partner there. Um, they, they have uh, a, a, ma a massive network of the top talent in the world. Yeah. So they'll bring together all of the artists and the performers. Um, IDECO is a, is a, a great staging and logistics company. Uh, so they're going to bring to the table the, uh, the, the, the execution piece of it. Uh, our, our role specifically is organization, design, identity, um, sponsorship, um, partnership acquisition. Right, right. Um, unique for this event, I think, is that it's not for everybody. You know, Woodstock is not a brand, uh, is not a brand that is for everybody. Uh, so the brands that we're talking to are brands that have sort of an endemic uh, nature or purpose to the whole notion of Woodstock, which, by the way, uh, ties very well to the Geary uh, Foundation mission and values. So, um, is cannabis legal in, uh, <laughs> not yet. <laughs> you have to rush pretty quickly to get not it. <laughs> you can't really cash in on it unless right. it's legal. Right? But, but I, you can tell, so I've been to Coachella now seven years in a row. It's, you can tell it's legal in California now. <laughs> so how many people are you expecting to come to the event? What's, uh, we'll probably get 35,000 a day. Uh, three day event, so we 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 would I think we would easily have more than that, but but yeah. there are just restrictions to. So uh, you're not going to. I mean, not everyone can attend. You're going to. This is going to definitely be. Uh, It'll experienced be experienced by few, seen by many. That's true. It'll be a hot. It it will be a hot ticket. It's going to sure. be a high price ticket too. Or no? Well, uh, and no, we're going to sell normal day passes. Uh, and all the way up to VVIP glamping experiences with butler service and champagne. Oh, really? So it's that's yeah. the antithesis, antithesis yeah. of what the Woodstock is. Yeah. So for those the, for those that you know, they're a little they're a little on the older side now. But for those that were there 50 years ago, who happened to have the fortune to be able to afford uh, a VVIP glamping experience, they'll they'll have <laughs> they'll have a pretty amazing experience. And for those who weren't there 50 years ago, will have a pretty amazing experience. What kind of music? Well. Acts are, uh, well, any, 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 anywhere from, um, from like the original Woodstockers that are still left to people like, um, uh, Kesha and others. So we're, what we're doing is we're trying to mash up, uh, you know, the, the, this notion of old and new, uh, and make it really a, a pop relevant experience rather than just a music festival. Wow. It's already so, documentary. I mean, you have document. We're hopefully doc going to have some movie screenings. So movie just so really? you know, just <laughs> you know. I heard somewhere your dad's. In the yeah, process yeah. Hopefully of, it comes uh, yeah. out by then. Something comes out by then. <laughs> well, we'll keep our eye on that event for sure. Um, Thank you. One other thing I wanted to ask you about is I saw you have an office in Detroit. We do. And tell Detroit is getting some love these days after a hard time. Tell me about the that is a, mostly to serve automotive clients. Um, what's the thinking there? It is. It is. And it was. And we've been there now for, I think, four years. Um, and I, I can't say that we're the reason that Detroit is getting the love. But, um, you know, D Detroit is an amazing place. Um, it has been through hell and back. And it's got this interesting uh personality the city itself and the people that live there are extremely passionate and and caring uh, about so many things 
And, and one of those things is the quality of, work, of the work that they do. So some of the best creative that we are doing uh, as an agency is coming out of our Detroit office as a result because the, the, it's like in the water there or something. I'm not sure. Very That's interesting. Right. So uh, let's, uh, one question I like to ask at kind of the end is you've been through, this is version 2.0 of this agency, but you talked about your dad and working uh, Jack Morton what are the, what's the wisdom that you think you need to tell this next generation about wanting to be in the event industry and what's so great about it or what what is it fraught with wow. in terms of detail the yeah. problems yeah be careful with what you think you want <laughs> <laughs> um no i would say that um you know i've now been doing this i think 30 not including like my childhood days uh which 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 would predate this but i've been doing this 35 years uh, and I think the single greatest gift that I've been given by this industry is that you are exposed to and learn something new every single day um, because of the, the, the kinds of things that we get to do as an industry and who we get to work with. Um, and what we're exposed to, you, you learn something new every single day. I mean, you're talking Woodstock, China, Korea, <laughs> like in like the yeah, third of this one total, half hour totally, conversation. <laughs> totally. And, and, and I think that, you know, we, what we do not to like steal Steve Jobs's quote, but you know, like, like we make an impact in the world. I yeah. think that, you know, we don't make the same kind of impact that Beyonce made at Coachella, for instance, but because we have the ability to meet with and work with the titans of industry and design ideas for them and their teams that they actually execute and roll out across the world, we can sit back and say, wow, I was a part of that moment. I was a part of the success of that product or I was a part of the success of that program. And I don't know of a lot of other industries or careers where you can honestly say that we have the ability to, to really change the world uh, when we get up every morning to go to work. So I think those two things in particular stand out for me. Thanks, Scott. Well, tell everybody how they can reach you and learn more about Invent. Right. So uh, again, I'm Scott Cullither. I'm the uh, CEO of Invent. You can reach us at www.inventinvnt.com. The, uh, uh, the VNT is important to know. It is. There's no E, yes. so it's misspelled. It's the word invent misspelled. Um, we have seven offices. We're here in uh, New York, which is where our global headquarters is. We're in Detroit. We're in Washington, D.C. We're in San Francisco. Uh, we are in London. Uh, we're in Sydney, and we just opened, uh, I'm really excited about it, a design studio in Sweden called the Swedish Design Studio, SWDSH Design Studio. Wow, it's fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Scott. We look forward thank to you, more David. conversations. Yeah, nice to see you both. Thank you. Thanks. David, we're back in our studio now, and uh, Scott has really weathered changes in his business and the industry. I'm wondering what, what is his key to surviving or what's the key to surviving in this time of change? Well, you know, it's so funny. He thought he sold out and he was going to take the money and run. And then he got reinvigorated, which I think happens to a lot of founders where they say, oh my God, these guys, I thought they were geniuses, but they weren't so much geniuses. And, you know, let's just lumber along and uh, we can rethink it and do it better the next time. Mm hmm. So one thing that he teased us with was the, the oh, knowledge yeah. of the end that he's working on the 50th anniversary of Woodstock. Um, well, you know, I'll be looking for how they move that event into the future. I mean, it is an anniversary year uh, and it's an event that's that's so steeped in nostalgia in our culture. But, you know, the the market has changed. People expect yeah. different things out of festivals. And uh, the person who's going to be attending that is not the person who attended it 50 years ago. Maybe some of them will be there. Yeah, but, but uh, uh, what happens is yeah. that they kind of leave the planet <laughs> at yeah. some point. But, I mean, they're going to they're gonna have to honor the history yeah. of that event, yeah. right? That's why they're doing it, you know, or it won't feel authentic uh, and they would lose their credibility. But at the same time, you have to bring it into the modern age of music festivals, right? Well, I think that the whole idea is putting a twist on everything. The experiential is, is no longer just telling the straight story, but telling it with a twist. Mm -hmm. So we'll keep an eye out for that. So what's going on at BizBash, Beth? 
We are thrilled to announce that our first digital magazine of the year is out this week. It's our design issue, and this one has so much great event design in it. Read about a group we're calling the Event Design Rebels, people who are pushing events in new directions with their fabrication, staging, lighting, floral design, and catering. Also, check out the strategy story on the new wave of events seeking to empower women and a trend piece on how virtual venue tours are involving and so much more. So check your inboxes Fantastic. for that. Our subscribers will receive that right in right in uh, your inbox. Everyone else will be able to find that on bizbash.com. And I would love to make sure everybody knows that they should sign up for the BizBash daily newsletter. And uh, you can go to bizbash, um, dot, bizbash.com forward slash subscribe to get to that. This podcast is produced by Dave Nelson with the support of Claire Hoffman from our editorial team and Rebecca Pappas in our audience development department. Thank you so much for making this possible. Gather on. Gather on. Thanks for listening to today's episode. If you like what you're hearing, be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or your favorite podcast app. We can be found on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Player FM, Google Play, and Pocket Cast. Be sure to leave us a rating and review. It helps others discover the Gather Geeks podcast. We'd also love to hear from you. You can leave feedback on Twitter at GatherGeeks or leave us an email, gathergeeks at bizbash.com. We hope you'll join us again for the next episode of Gather Geeks. Until then, gather on. If you are looking for a state-of-the-art learning management system, take a look at Digitel's newest platform, Opus DX. Opus DX offers the robust platform for event organizers and associations to manage content. To learn more and schedule a demo, email them at contactus at digitelinc.com. That's contactus at D-I-G-I-T-E-L-L-I-N-C dot com.